this wall here, it's referred to as the peace wall or the interface wall, just splits the whole of sort of West Belfast really. West Belfast is probably 90% Catholic, Nationalist, Republican. That's all over here. That small 10% of West Belfast that is Protestant, Loyalist, is this small area here. I was born and reared here, Robert Stanton in the street here. And I lived here until 1969. And there was a row, this was all a row of houses. The streets going off it. And over there it was the same. And it was a mixed street, mixed between Catholics and Protestants. And we all mixed, when we, before the trouble started, we all mixed and played with each other and carried on. Mackey's factory, which was mainly loyalist, was on the, just on the other side of the wall here. And they all used to come over this way, all going home to the shankle and whatever. And windows started to get broken, rows and fights in the streets started to break out. My house, obviously, this whole row of houses here and along here was completely got up and burnt to the ground, including uh, Protestant houses. When the loyalists were coming in and burnt down these streets, then local residents came out and built barricades. They used barns, lorries, buses, whatever they could get, dug up the paving stones, used all that there. And when the army arrived, the army then took those away and replaced them with you know, the big wooden necks wow. with the ball went through them. They then replaced the wooden fences with metal poles in the ground. They then reinforced them with corrugated sheeting. And then they built a brick wall. Gradually, over the years, they realised, obviously, that the walls were going to be a permanent feature of the conflict, and they built them up to where they are. I grew up in West Belfast, a well, part of West Belfast that was a unionist dominated part. The street we moved into when I was like four years of age, we were only the third Catholic family to move in. Uh, and we were the only young family. The other two Catholic families were, believe it or not, retired RUC men. So, but grew up. Happy childhood, no problem until the conflict erupted in, in, in the late 60s. Uh, and uh, in 1972, loyalists came to my house. I was only uh, 14 at the time and actually asked for me by name. And my father was suspicious immediately because at that stage, none of my friends, I had no friends in that particular area. But, uh, you know, I, I knocked about the Clonard area. That was where most of my friends would have been. None of them would have walked the distance up the Springfield Road. It was like a ghost town at night, a lot of sectarian attacks and killings and so forth. Uh, but my father was suspicious. Asked him what he wanted to talk to me about and interrogated him. But in advance, he said, no, it's not me. It's this guy over here on a motorbike. My, my old fella says, well, what does he want to talk to him about? And... Uh, I got the guy back down the path, pulled out a handgun, and started firing in. Lucky enough, nobody was injured, but the upshot was that we had to up and leave the very next morning. Not long after that, I joined uh, the FENA, which was the youth wing of the IRA. And, and when I was old enough, uh, I enlisted into the IRA. and was basically on, on active service until I went into prison. We were sack class citizens. But the biggest cigarette factory in the world, by far, was just at the bottom of our street, but nobody seemed to get a job in it from our particular community. And in this kind of sense of being stopped three or three times going to the bus to go to school by the army. Everything and anything that happened in this area was under British uh, military control. The school that I went to, St Paul's Secondary School, just over Beachmount, was taken over by the army. And when we used to go to school in the morning, we used to have to walk through their, their, their blocks, their road blocks. Some of them were quite brutal, some of them because it was a Chelsea supporter, and they just had Manchester United shirts on that would they got there. But after a while you come conditioned that they shouldn't be here. So I got involved in the rats. Myself and another guy called Sean O'Reardon went to the same school, became best of friends. In 1972, just behind the wall here, he was 13 years of age and he threw a he stood on a petrol bomb in the derelict building. Now at that time the British Army did use the derelict buildings for observation, posts and watching and whatever within the areas. And a lot of times they would get caught, a lot of times they wouldn't get caught. But he was throwing the petrol bomb into the building and he was shot dead by the army, um, 13 years of age. I remember the wee memorial card um, that his mummy gave me. And on the back of that there was a wee verse about revenge. And that's what I looked at and that's what I seen, that's what I was thinking. You become involved in what's going on in and around the areas and you become more involved. And by the time I was 16, just going into 17, 
that's when I was arrested and put in jail um, in Long Cash. Uh, I was caught with a mass amount of explosives in, in the house and also charged with putting a bomb in an army barracks in Springfield Road down here. And uh, I was sentenced to 15 years for doing that at that time. I spent 23 and a half years in prison. What age? I was 17. And then I was caught in a shootout, just a couple of streets, just down the street there, with the SAS. They found out we, we had an ambush set up, the SAS found about it. They attacked the house, so it was Captain West McCart. He was, uh, he, he was the head of that particular squad, he was killed in action. I went to jail when I was 16, on oh, three different occasions, arrested every time, red-handed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which, which says something, I suppose. Um, I served 21 years in all uh, as a result of that and I was released in 1998 at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. 1972 I was arrested. I was 16 years of age. Uh, my older brother, he was 18 at the time, um, he was uh, an IRA volunteer, he shot dead by the British Army. Um, within a few minutes uh, a young British soldier was shot dead, Ian Burke, released in 1975, was arrested again in 1983, uh, brought to England, charged in England, sentenced in England, um, did about 11 years over there, went through all the jails over there, up and down the country. Um, was transferred back in 1994 because of the, the ceasefire. The day after the ceasefire, we were actually transferred. Spent another few years in the H blocks there. Um, and then was released uh, under the Good Friday Agreement. If I hadn't been released under the Good Friday Agreement, I'd still be in jail. Um, with no prospect of release. These are the exact same cells we were in in criminal jail as well. And you've only one bed here, but you would have had two or three people in, in, in the jail. You know, bed and a single bed here as well. And there's the original toilet paper. That's the original paper. That's what we had to use. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> when we were doing the drawings, we would use it for tracing. Ah, tracing right. papers were, were drawn on that there, you know what I mean? And then, if there was a protest of any format on which it was pretty regular, and the night before you filled out the brim, <coughs> the three is filled out the brim, and the protest, one of the forms of protest would be that when the screw opens the door in the morning, the prison opens the door in the morning, right? As soon as you open the door to let you out, to throw this in the rubbish bin. Just fucking throw it around him. You throw it around him, just throw it in the ground. Run in the corner, roll up the ball, and just get the crap kicked out of you. And that was a normal bet. Was just, but he started more covered in shit and pissed. <laughs> I was also uh, part of the hunger strike in, in 1981, when when ten of our volunteers died in the H blocks. I started hunger strike on the 10th of August 1981, and was on the hunger strike until the 3rd of October that same year. 55 days. I probably would have been dead within 48 hours. They reckon. The reason why we got involved with the IRA was to get the British Army out. One of the figures that was bandied about here um, during the course of the conflict was, look, there's only 50 of these guys, or there's only 100 of them, and, you know, and I'm going to sort out these 100, and the problem goes away. You know, as far as we're concerned, it was a community in conflict between 25 and 30,000 former IRA prisoners. If they weren't in the IRA, they were probably um, making their houses available. And Do you know what I mean? It, it, our take on it is that it was a people of war. I'm going to give a presentation that I give to younger people in the UK to try and let you understand why someone would join the army. From a young age, I was fascinated by the military um, remembrance parades, you know, with the poppies and the, the last post and um, war films on the TV, uh, reading these comic books. I wanted to join the army and I wanted to join the, the best regiment I could join, so I joined the parachute regiment. After I'd done six years in the, uh, in the parachute regiment, I applied to join the, the special air service. I was um, sent up to Baghdad to work in a, a special ops team up there. Um, and our job was to capture high value targets and these were people that we decided uh, were running the insurgency. So you're in your home, you're in your bed, everyone's asleep and all of a sudden there's a huge explosion either in your front door or in, in the wall of your house. There's a huge explosion, there's a huge noise, uh, there's dust all in your house 
And before you've worked out what's going on, there's 20 armed men have come through the, the hole and you can hear them running, moving through your house. And they're coming up the stairs, they're in your room. And uh, you'd be dragged out of your bed, your mum and dad would be dragged out of bed, the sister would be dragged out of bed. And then we'd split you up. We'd take all the males of military age, which is anyone 16 upwards, and we'd put them in a room that we held, held at gunpoint. Your sister and your mother, they'd be taken into another room held at gunpoint. My job at this point was to go through your house and tear it apart. We took all the mobile phones, the money, any uh, weapons we found. We'd take computers, we'd take your birth certificates, your passports, everything. We'd put it into these big bags. We'd have a name and a photo. And it was rarely the case that when we got into these buildings that these people were there. It was someone else. But our attitude was that if they were in this building, they must be guilty of something because we've been watching this building for a while. We'd put these plastic cuffs around them, put a hood on, and then we'd hand them over to another unit and then end up in a prison where people were tortured. Cattle prods were used, dogs, water, brutal interrogations, humiliation, and knowing that I was involved in taking these people out of their houses and then that they were being tortured started to disturb me. You know, the looks on children's faces, the looks on the wives, the men literally pissed themselves were crying their eyes out because they knew what was going to happen to them. And I suppose it all came to a head uh, for me when the CO came over and he said that he was worried that we were becoming the secret police of Baghdad. And I looked around and, and the buildings that we were living in were the same buildings that Saddam Hussein's henchmen used to live in. And the prisons we were using were the same ones that Saddam Hussein's henchmen had used. And I started to think, well, maybe the people we're picking up were the same people that Saddam Hussein used to pick up. And I said that I wasn't going to wasn't gonna go back to Iraq. Um, and luckily for me, I thought I was going to end up in prison, but um, for a whole load of reasons, uh, I was discharged from the army. Whenever the British soldiers were sent in to look for people uh, who were on the internment list, they had an order, and we, we have actually got a copy of this. Um, if, say, you go in looking for John O'Hagan, and John O'Hagan isn't there, take all males over the age of 18. You could be talking about Iraq or you could be talking about Falls yeah. Road. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, the same things happen to our people here. And I have to say, speaking for myself, you know, coming and listening to you, like, it always fascinates me how people can join an army and not think they're going to kill people and not think they're going to be turned into robots. I have a lot of cousins and a lot of nephews and nieces who are brought up in England. And I have to say that there were six members of my family in Northern Ireland who was prisoners. I was interned at 16. My nieces and nephews have come to visit me and they have talked about um, their friends going to Afghanistan. Now this is 30, 40 years after we were, like mm -hmm. the Battle Murphy Massacre, yeah. you know. And it was a whole emotion with me and I was sort of trying to talk to them as beautiful children. Um, the father Irish and mother English. Um, the rights and wrongs, you know. You're being used, your country, okay, you love England, you love your friends in school. But they thought that this was a thing they had to do because, you know, their friends said it, they went to school, they were talking about yeah. their deaths and things. But at 16, I mean, you were talking there and I about, um, which raised an awful emotion inside me. I mean, I was so, back when I was 16 again, you're talking about getting into a house in Afghanistan and children and the fathers and the mothers and the children all of fear. And I mean, you're talking about one o'clock in the morning, it was actually four o'clock in the morning that the Saracens mm -hmm. used to come here. The smell of petrol, the noise, everything stayed with us. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd be 16 next year. But I mean, that never leaves anybody. Yeah. Our mothers and fathers went through that every single night. Our, you know, maybe four sons out of one family or every second door, it was, it was yeah. the same. I don't think um, that the, uh, the portrayal of the British military and the portrayal of British military history allows 16, 17 year olds to understand what it's really about. It's different here. It was something that the war came to us. We weren't a toddler in the schools the way you were, you know, and it was a different thing. Our communities were invaded. We were just taught to believe, before we joined the army and when we joined the army, that if I was in a position where I have to kill someone, my country is always the good guy. Yeah. So you could never see the other side of the argument. I wasn't in the side of right, you know, I mean, we were patrolling the, the streets out there with a big SL arm in your hand that you could take an elephant down with, uh, people going shopping and we could stop and search them and people going out to the city centre, it was all, remember, it was all chicaned off and you had to get searched to go shopping. That part of the, I hated that, it was something, 
proven me wrong with certain people going shopping. When the guy started talking like me, my Republican blood was starting to boil and I just thought, what the frick am I doing mm. in among a pack of breaths like? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But it was only in listening to him then and seeing where it developed on, then the, see to get to that truth and to that reconciliation and everything else, like we would go and talk to people about our activism and mm. what we did, you know, and I suddenly got an, an understanding really mm. of how other people feel, you know, because of our actions. I met yeah. former Betty Soldiers before, I did, a, I did a, it's called Facing the Truth with a woman called uh, said Foster. Her husband was killed in Warren Point. We had a discussion like this on camera. Then we were taken away for a break because we were going to do like kind of a, a website yeah. interview. And I was taking one end of the mansion she was in the other. And as soon as her and Tom and Graham, two former paratroopers, they turned around and introduced us and voiced <coughs> Joe. So we put Joe on the other side and said, well, we would like to have lunch. But the producers run over the BBC and said, this woman wants you to have lunch with her. After me telling her on camera, when her husband was killed, uh, we, we had a party at night in Long Case Prison. She was shocked by that and she was horrified. And then when we had, just sitting around having sandwiches, talking about the youth work we're doing, the work me and Tommy's doing, uh, my own family upbringing like out there. And in a sense she says, I can't forgive the people who, who killed my husband, but I have a better understanding of the conflict and it's a sense of closure for her. And we went out the door, she actually came over and put her arms around me. And that sense, and that's that's one person. But you're talking about nine hundred families. Yeah. We're talking about getting some input into relation to talking to those families. Yeah, yeah. They must be looking at the situation. There's a peace process. They're they're trying to deal with the past. But who's who's talking to us? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm an ex Falklands vet, and uh, this was started with the Falklands Families Association, where the yeah. wives of the injured came together. Well, the first thing the establishment did was made Colonel H. Jones's wife president of the. The Families yeah. Association. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, I've been along to some of these meetings, and her raise on death is, didn't our guys do a wonderful job out there? And my husband died so gloriously, he got the Victoria Cross. So, if you're not careful, all it does is become another yeah, arm yeah. of that it's same. Another remembrance for you know, no you know. It's so tough because, don't forget, the British, British establishment has been at this a long time all over the world, <coughs> and they're masters at it. I don't think that it's right that young children of 16 should be forced into a war to hold a gun in their hand to kill, you know, when they don't even know what life is about. Yeah. I think it's wrong. I sometimes think that if we had realised how much power Great Britain had, then what were we thinking of? You know, a small nation like I mean, we weren't even a small nation. It was you know, young it was people and, and kids. Yeah. We do a lot of outreach with kids, myself and a, a loyalist, either a single identity or a cross community. And basically, what I say, what we went through, the conditions were there to push us into war. There were no conditions now. There is no justification at all. It's time to plant the seed in our little heads. This is what we went through: the imprisonment, the effects that it had on our families, the effects that it had on our own communities. And trying to trying to you know encourage these young people not to follow a nose lane. Cause we have issues within our own communities. There's those who are against the peace process, against the free trade agreement. We're trying to feed on the frustration of, of young people. So it's up to us out there to fight that battle and talking to young people that don't go down that route. We do a lot of time on the interfaces, uh, Stuart and events. This area used to be really bad. Our down is the the, the prime um, uh, hot spot. Hot spot at the minute. But Dunkern Garden, just a few hundred yards down the road, it used to be really bad. And working with loyalist ex-prisoners um, uh, at PSNI, other community groups, the, there's very few incidents down there now. It's, well, it's sometimes during the summer it's a wee bit sporadic, but um, very compared to years ago, there's, there's practically nothing. Everybody wants the wall down. Everybody. Yeah. Right? If you don't want the wall down, there's something wrong in your head. Yeah. You want the wall down. And the great and the glorious come in here and tell us how to do it. See the woman that lives in that house over there? Yeah. You see the woman that lives in the house behind this wall? They're the ones that will make a decision when that wall comes down. Because you take that wall down tomorrow, a two-year-old child could walk over and break that window. Yeah. Could be by accident, could be a football, doesn't matter. Somebody's going to come out and break a window over here. Yeah. We're not at that stage yet. We're not at that stage for the wall to come down. 
what we need to do, and, and that's what we do, and that's the work we do like this, and we do work with loyalists and unionists, and we do work with uh, young people from both communities, we need to start building confidence in these people here and in them people to make them understand. They, this is a generation of people that live how far away, 100 yards from each other. They've never seen each other. Uh, I done uh, two years ago with a group of young people from the Shankland and from Falls, and we walked down here one Saturday morning. The football pits just down there, that blue bicycle sign is the football pit there. And we got the young Catholic lads to come over, and we walked down here on a Saturday morning, pissing rain. The young lads were wearing, Catholics were wearing the Celtic tops, the young lads were wearing the Rangers tops, playing a match. Boss was great as 10 now, 10 1. <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, we, we had a big event for the rest of the day. We'd done tours with all the young people. We had a big event up in a training centre there, a big uh, talking session with people were all coming in, meeting and talking to stuff. That's the closest I've ever seen or ever heard of anybody in these three parts coming together. To me, it makes me, gives me a bit of comfort to look back and say, it is possible, on a bigger scale, it is possible.